Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the Financing the Net Zero Transition uh, session. Uh, we're going to have a lively discussion for the next 45 minutes in this public forum, and then we will uh, go into a private session with forum uh, members and partners when um, they will get a chance to ask questions. Let me just take a moment to set the scene. Trillions of dollars we know are needed to finance the net zero transition, particularly in those industries that have been termed hard to obey, transport, chemicals, aviation. Uh, we know that money is needed, it's not flowing. Uh, and uh, it's not flowing because there are constraints and we will tease some of that out. It seems clear that uh, the private sector needs to do more, uh, the financial sector needs to do more, uh, the public sector needs to do more. But how these three interact with each other and what are the kind of um, incentives and the reduction of barriers we need to see is something we need to get at today. This, sister, uh, this uh, session builds off the WEF initiative, which is financing transition to a net zero future. And uh, I would encourage everybody to take a look at that initiative. It has some, some bold action which is being outlined. But let me, without further ado, introduce you to our panel. Um, uh, first, uh, the Honorable Al Gore, who is chairman and co-founder of Generation Investment Management. Welcome. Uh, secondly, Mark Carney, who is finance advisor to the Prime Minister for COP26 and UN Special Envoy for Climate Action and Finance. Uh, we also have Dr. Werner Hoyer, president of the European Investment Bank. Welcome. Stephanie von Friedenberg, who is the Interim Managing Director and Executive Vice President of the International Finance Corporation. And uh, we have Oliver Bate, who is Chief Executive Officer for Allianz. And you see this group really spans um, long-term investors, shorter-term investment, investors, government, and the multilateral uh, development banks. So, um, uh, Al Gore, maybe I can start with you because you've had the privileged position of sitting both on the public side um, of the equation and now on the private side. What are the constraints? Why aren't these trillions of dollars in the hard to abate industries actually flowing? Well, thank you, Carolina. And first of all, may I say it's quite an honor to be with such distinguished colleagues uh, on this panel. Uh, and I'm sure I will learn more than I can impart, but I will do my best. We are in a, a, an almost unprecedented uh, global transition. Uh, many call it the sustainability revolution empowered by new digital technologies with much greater precision. You know, um, uh, a couple of decades ago, one of the oil ministers in Saudi Arabia uh, said publicly, uh, the Stone Age uh, ended not because of a shortage of stones, and the uh, Petroleum Age will end not because of a shortage of petroleum. We're seeing that now. The obstacles you ask about uh, are in part uh, because the metrics uh, we have used uh, since Bretton Woods uh, uh, do not take into account a negative externalities, nor positive externalities, the benefits of uh, investments in public goods, do not take into account uh, inequalities in the distribution of incomes and net worths, do not take into account the depletion of resources like topsoil and groundwater uh, and others. Uh, and uh, there are other uh, deficiencies. We also have obstacles in the field of policy capture uh, by incumbent legacy industries, which take uh, the normal course of human nature and building up influence and creating networks of uh, influence. But we are now seeing a transition in the political world uh, that may uh, come to match the transition in technologies. We've seen it uh, in renewable electricity uh, generation and uh, electric vehicles. We're seeing it in other sectors. And now in the political world, uh, we're less than a few hours into the first week of the Biden-Harris administration. But in advance of uh, that transition here 
in the U.S., we saw major new commitments by the European Union, by China, by Japan, by South Korea. Uh, and now the world uh, appears to be close to a new alignment uh, to start flowing a mix of uh, private and public investment uh, uh, funds uh, into uh, this uh, into accelerating this transition. Uh, one final point, uh, the Oxford, you had uh, 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 Joe Stiglitz in that lead in uh, memo, uh, Joe and uh, Nick Stern and others were part of the Oxford Review of Economic Policy recently that showed uh, happily investments uh, in these new sustainability uh, measures create three to four times as many jobs per dollar invested as investments in the old economy. So even as we struggle with the pandemic and institutional uh, inequalities and the devastation in the economy caused by uh, the pandemic and most uh, dangerous of all the climate crisis, we are seeing an impressive movement in both the public and private spheres towards solutions. Thank you very much. And I think that's, a, that's an optimistic um, read, uh, uh, realistic, but, but also optimistic. Uh, perhaps, uh, of the current situation. Al Gore spoke of a new alignment. It's, it's long been said that in some ways the private sector has been in advance of the public sector in beginning to look at uh, what this would mean for regulation, for, for metrics, for incentives. Do you see a switch um, here? And as you look at the work you're doing for COP26, do you see that public sector now involvement, greater involvement coming to, coming to fruition? Well, thank, thanks for having me, Caroline. And I, like Al, I'm gonna learn more than, uh, than I give, but let me try and give it a bit here, which is to pick up where Al left off, which is you get this alignment globally, 127 countries and counting uh, with commitments to net zero uh, and I put the emphasis on and counting. Um, and that global net zero is cascading down through the private sector. Uh, Oliver uh, can speak of many things, but one of the things he can emphasize is what's happening with asset owners. So the, the large pension funds, insurance companies, sovereign wealth funds, and their commitments, explicit commitments to net zero. A partner of ours at Generation Management has set up a uh, asset manager alliance of over nine trillion of assets and their commitments uh, to net zero. Um, and we will look to for COP uh, by Glasgow to have those types of commitments across the financial sector, uh, running into the private banking sector as well. Now, Caroline, your question is spot on, which is what are public sector institutions doing in parallel um, and do they have the full orientation? Now, Werner uh, uh, can speak to uh, what the EIB is doing, but when we look at, which is, which is very impressive, if I may say, that, that laser-like focus on the transition, when we look across the whole spectrum though, of multilateral development banks, development finance, uh, finance institutions, so what our governments are giving you money, there isn't that same level of orientation. This is the year in order to get it. Um, it is exceptionally important that we don't just have, I mean, it will be a very odd situation if we have the core of the private financial sector oriented to net zero by Glasgow, governments oriented to net zero, but not the MDB community uh, fully oriented to net zero. Um, and that's, that's part of what we need to fill in. Um, and crucially, if we can, um, this will help, help unlock very large blended finance flows. So mixture of public and private uh, money, blended finance flows to emerging and developing economies. That's part of the necessary architecture. I know, and I'll, I'll hand back to you, I know this is um, a, a party for the Italian G20. It's certainly a priority uh, for COP26, and I know it's a priority for a number of those uh, multilateral development banks, but we need to have this focus on it so that we can unlock all forms of, of, of finance. So thank you, Mark. And, and um... Stephanie and then Verna, I'm going to come to both of you because you do represent the multilateral development banks. And I think uh, Mark Carney just laid down a, a challenge to you both um, to um, help step up the work of the MDBs across the board going forward. Um, Stephanie at IFC, um, I know you've also done a lot. What, how do you see this agenda rolling out in terms of the cooperation that there needs to be between that public and that private. We've seen during COVID and the development of a vaccine, we've seen the most incredible collaboration 
that's taken place to speed up the vaccine. We haven't seen that on the net zero um, agenda yet. What's missing and, and what, from your perspective as an MDB, to, what do you think needs to happen and is happening? Great question, Caroline. And first, thank you very much uh, for having me. It's an honor to be here and it's certainly an honor to be with this panel. And as you rightly said, climate and our performance standards have been at the core of what we've done since uh, the beginning and the creation of IFC. But putting a sharper lens and a sharper focus on it, when I look at emerging markets, uh, one of the issues that I see is that there are a lack of bankable projects. So how do we take uh, critical operators and bring them into our countries of operation? And in order to do that, Mark rightly said, we need blended finance. We need to find a way to make these de-risk these projects and attract sponsors who can build things that matter in relation to being net zero. That's one. Uh, and in order to do that, uh, what we really need to do is standardize some of these types of platforms. So one of the things that we've been working on, we started in Zambia, we created something called Scaling Solar. And what we found was if we worked collaboratively with the government, we gave them technical assistance and we created a core package of bid documents that any reliable operator could understand. We brought the best world-class operators to Zambia uh, and built grid-stable uh, solar. We then rolled it out to six other African countries. We just did one in Afghanistan and, and one in Uzbekistan. The one in Uzbekistan, two and a half cents a kilowatt hour. And again, with that, we put staple terms that included blended finance. So finding ways to blend the public and the private to de-risk these type of operations but also to help operators and companies understand the framework in which they're investing is super important in the emerging markets in particular. It's different in the developed world, but one of the things that we are absolutely sure of in order to get to net zero and to tackle the other difficult challenges, we have to find a way to create the projects that people are gonna be investing in. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, Van Ahoya, um, we've heard a lot for many years about this issue of People with the money say, there, where are the projects? And people with the projects say, where are the money? And we can, where's the money? We kind of talk past each other. And we've also talked a lot about de-risking. Um, I know the European Investment Bank is, has been doing a lot, but Mark Carney reminds us that the MDB community as a whole perhaps hasn't stepped up to the challenge. What do you need to see to, uh, from your perspective, to encourage partners to come in, to take these, I'm thinking in particularly these big lumpy investments in a hard to abate industries like transport, like shipping, like chemicals. These aren't easy industries, but their transition will make an enormous difference. What do you need to see to get that money to flow? Well, we have already heard some of the responses. Uh, Gore said we need to better internalize external effects, uh, be they positive or negative. And if I look at the carbon prices uh, around the world, that's not sufficient. That is not enough incentive to, to, to invest. Uh, secondly, uh, we have heard from, from, from Mark that uh, it is a, there is quite a considerable difference between the public sector and the private sector. And sometimes I have the feeling the private sector is ahead. I had the huge advantage that these 27 member states of the European Union who own this very bank were ready to be convinced that we must change course dramatically. And we did that with our new lending, energy lending policy and the climate bank roadmap. It's much more difficult for, for uh, multilaterals who, are, who have a completely different ownership where we have really clashes of cultures in this respect. So it is not easily transferable from, from, from our experience to, to the others. And then I would say it is quite obvious, and we probably agree on this, the, the, the investment needs are so enormous. And in my view, the projects are there, if you look at it more closely and help some people to better make their pro products bankable. Then we need public money to, as, a, as a kickoff, but the whole thing that needs to be done by the private sector. Everybody who believes these challenges can be met by the public sector uh, are dead wrong, in my view. So we have made good experiences with the, with the Juncker plan, for instance, where we said the minimal incentive of the first loss peace taking by the European budget can do the trick. And it did. 
and we need much more because we what we need for these projects is patient capital, long-term commitment. And that requires uh, also a little bit more courage on the side of the public sector. Thank you very much, Werner. Um, Oliver Bate, uh, you uh, represent uh, asset owners, and we know that especially long-term institutional investors, um, there's a lot of money. Uh, there's a lot of interest, I think, in those long-term uh, projects, uh, those long-term returns, that patient capital. From your perspective, uh, and we have seen the pension funds move, we have seen the insurance uh, industry move, what more needs to happen to unlock this capital? And perhaps, um, Oliver, you could talk a little bit about within, within the financing project cycle, there are points at which the risk is greater. Is there a role for within the finance community for greater cooperation so that different players are assuming different levels of risk that they may be more comfortable with? Thank you, Carolyn, and thank you uh, for having me. Um, I would love to just sum up what we've heard the last few minutes, because if you add up all the points, we, uh, we basically have answered your question why. We've just heard from Vanna, um, we want and are committed to do it, but sometimes we have very strong regulation that prevents us from investing, but that should not be an excuse, actually. Vanna just said it. We've done it, by the way, at Allianz together with the IFC, uh, we could have heard that before we created through Allianz Global Investors a 5 billion fund where the IFC took a 500 million first loss piece and then we could get to a totally different level of capital charge. So carrying to your question, we need to look at regulation very carefully. And today, uh, the regulatory framework we have in Europe does actually disincentivize us helping with the transition, particularly on the equity or near equity side. So that clearly needs to be addressed. But it cannot be an excuse for our sector. That's why we created Net Zero. And again, we only started 18 months ago. So I'm a little bit more positive than other people are about the speed. 18 months ago, we started with nothing. Now we have 5 trillion. I think we should use the next year to get to 10 trillion. And that will really move markets. Because if we commit to Net uh, Zero with our assets and the asset managers do the same, there's no escape. Now, what do we need more? We need much more quickly now measurable changes in the way companies account. We can only follow net zero transition by industry and company if the companies have to report and it cannot be an elective it has to be a must and we don't need three five years whatever with FASB and the IFSD and everybody else in the golf clubs to really debate that we need the actions and decisions now and then um, yes we have bankable projects but there's a lot more to be done for example in my home country in Germany there's a lot more to be done to do the energy transition. And we do actually lack bankable project. We don't lack the money. We lack the bankable project. And we often lack the competence in the public sector in terms of engineering know-how uh, in order to execute this, these projects. So we need public-private partnerships and know-how. And uh, we need to hold people accountable. You know, currently we're chasing ever more stringent commitments, do it faster, do it faster. I don't think we need new commitments. We need uh, a lot more execution. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Oliver. Um, I think we've heard a lot about the importance of metrics, the, the importance of standards, uh, the importance of enforceable standards and uh, single sets of standards. We, ha we have a world now where I think there's, there's a lot of politics around the, and a lot of turf around, around the different standards that you see. But Al Gore, I wanted to come back to you about some some specifics that you might look to to the public sector to provide. I mean, the public sector could co-invest with private investors. It could pr provide tax credits, um, loan guarantees, as we've heard. It could uh, subsidize com consumers to buy uh, green, uh, higher cost green products, if that's necessary to offset that higher cost. And it could commit to buying green products itself in its own procurement policies. And, and of course, there's the issue we heard about of, of carbon pricing. Um, where do you see this, this the, the biggest impera, imperative for where the public sector needs to go now? 
Well, Caroline, uh, for a long time, uh, the mainstream um, uh, e economics community has told policymakers that putting a price on carbon is the single most uh, beneficial and obvious step. But the political resistance uh, to any kind of new uh, tax uh, is quite uh, significant. I, I have some scars to prove uh, what I've just said. And so uh, much of the world, including Europe, uh, including China now uh, and others, are, are going to uh, indirect uh, pricing of carbon with emissions trading. Uh, but uh, in the background, what we're seeing is an ever rising demand by consumers, uh, by executive teams and their families and employees, uh, to the private companies uh, in the forum. You know that when you are interviewing the best and brightest new women and men coming out of universities and technical schools, they're interviewing you. They want your values to be aligned with theirs. Uh, there is a kind of uh, struggle in the world today uh, between what you might call Earth Incorporated with the ever uh, more elaborate interconnection of economies on the one hand and the emergence of what you might describe as a kind of global conscience uh, with young people in particular, not only Greta Thunberg's generation, but others saying, look, the science is very clear. We're putting 162 million tons of heat trapping uh, global warming pollution into the sky every single day. Uh, we're <laughs> destroying our future unless we change quickly. Uh, and, and so whether, whether we muster the political will to actually put a direct tax on these emissions uh, remains to be seen. But regulations uh, are politically uh, more feasible. Uh, we're seeing uh, the requirement uh, that uh, ever increasing percentages of uh, electricity comes from renewable sources, for example. We're seeing prospective bans on internal combustion engines and mobility. We're now even beginning to see for the thousand degrees Celsius uh, use cases uh, where coal is still used, the green hydrogen may eventually play a role. And you add to that regenerative agriculture and sustainable forestry and the initiatives in shipping and uh, air transport, uh, the, the latter may take more time, we'll see. Uh, but uh, we are moving. And you know, the late man, uh, Nelson Mandela once said, it's always impossible until it's done. What we're seeing now uh, is a gathering of the forces, both private and public, fueled by uh, this uh, global conscience uh, to secure our future. Uh, and, and the financing is going to follow that, those commitments. Thank you. Um, so, so I think, as you said, the, <clears throat> the carbon price obviously uh, remains a very central issue, but as you pointed out, there are, there are things that can be done beyond that. Mark Carney, I want to come back to this issue of political will and, and, and talk a little bit about vaccines and COVID again. If you look at the investment that has had to take place uh, for vaccine development, if you look at the public-private partnership that's taken place with the public sector um, or from, from the outset talking about its commitment to purchase vaccines. Yeah. Um, we have a real model there in front of us about what can happen fast when that political will exists. How do we create that political will for, for moving forward in these areas? Al Gore said, we are moving. There's a lot of optimism there. We heard some examples, but we haven't, we haven't reached that tipping point of, of moving over into accepting that this is a core part of public policy? Well, I think I disagree slightly. I think we're reaching the tipping point. The question is execution. How is that political will channeled? How is that so, the social movements that Al referred to uh, channeled? The energy then the expectations, how are they ch best channeled to have maximum impact? Um, and let me make a, a couple of suggestions. Um, the first is uh, on the carbon price. No, not everybody will be able to uh, handle the politics of the carbon price, but the value of a forward price on carbon, such as the one the Canadians just put in with rises to 170 legislated by $170 a ton by 2030, that is incredibly valuable. Janet Yellen and I did a big research project on this about six months ago, which said, if you have a credible path to carbon pricing or regulation 
what the market will do, we'll pull forward the adjustment, we'll smooth that adjustment. That's what markets do best. Um, and uh, by the time you get to the point where the price is high, the economy has adjusted. Now, as Al rightly says, it's diff it will be different in different jurisdictions. And as you rightly say, some of it will be uh, with respect to regulation. Let's take the example of internal combustion engines. In Europe, uh, there's a moratorium uh, from 2030 on new ICE cars. Um, same thing in the United Kingdom. That tells the auto industry and investors in the auto industry and investors in remote charging and others very clearly where that industry is going. And actually, it tells me where that industry is going, not just in Europe, but where it's ultimately going globally. It might go a little slower elsewhere, but that's where it's going globally. So the, again, credible forward commitments make a difference. Now, you rightly, Caroline, raise the example on um, commitments to purchase drugs. Now, we've seen this in the past. Bill Gates and the, the G7 did something for pneumococcus with uh, advanced market commitments. We've seen it with the COVID vaccines. Um, we've seen it. Um, with something called contracts for differences in the power industry, where uh, some governments have committed to buy down the cost of emerging solar and wind uh, technologies so that it's competitive. Ultimately, by the way, that does get passed on to consumers, but it's bought down so they become competitive. And what's happened, for example, offshore wind um, in Europe, including the UK, that's helped flip that over to become competitive globally. Um, and so the question we have for emerging technologies and vital technologies such as hydrogen, hydrogen as a blend in shipping, the impact on the hydrogen chain, if you will, up the chain to electrolyzers, you know, uh, machines that will help uh, create the hydrogen. What advanced commitments can be put in place that will pull forward that demand? And again, I'm sorry, I'm leaning a bit on Europe here, but um, uh, the European Recovery Fund and some of those initiatives had hydrogen blends in there. Uh, we see a hydrogen strategy in other jurisdictions. It'd be very interesting what the U.S. does on hydrogen, which will have global applications. Uh, because again, and I'll finish here, if you have that credible forward commitment in scale, could be a regulation, could be a price, could be a um, a minimum amount of uh, you know a fuel blend, that allows the market and really the real economy, the companies that come up with these solutions um, to invest and build, and it shifts the equation. Um, and we're starting to see that, but that's one of the best ways to channel that uh, political will that you referenced. Thank you very much. So, so credible forward commitments um, create a signaling effect uh, and regulation creates a signal effect and then the market will, the market will respond. Stephanie, um, IFC has done a lot on <clears throat> trying to smooth the cost of big lumpy projects by, by looking at uh, preparation costs, by first loss guarantees, by really taking some of the load off, uh, particularly on the feasibility study end at, at the beginning, which I think often represents 10% of the total cost. Um, what do you see what do you want to see from governments? You spoke a little bit about your experience in solar, but in terms of that signaling effect, what do you want to see from the public sector? And you, you represent uh, 184 governments. Um, so, so you really are the, the public sector as well as speaking for the private sector and trying to bring the private sector into these deals. What do you think would make the biggest difference to to your partners in terms of public sector initiatives? Uh, great question, Caroline. Let me first say um, to Mark's point, in addition to creating forward purchases, which I think worked really well for vaccines, the second piece of that was warp speed and putting the right incentives in place for the manufacturers uh, to actually create the vaccines. I think the idea of a warp speed 2.0 with some public money sector by sector might be another way for us once you have a forward purchase framework in place to actually incent the right and brightest minds to figure out how we apply new technology. Um, but to our countries of, of operations themselves, I look uh, post COVID and I say before COVID, there was very limited fiscal space left. There is even less fiscal space now. So very much I agree with all the panelists in that this problem has to be solved by the private sector. What we really need governments to do is to create the right policy and regulatory environment and be willing to create public-private partnerships that will attract the private investment 
uh, to actually create the right projects and finance those projects. I do think there's patient capital on the sides. Getting that patient capital um, in, Oliver mentioned our MCPP platform, but finding ways to pull in pension funds, uh, sovereign wealth funds, uh, insurance companies who have long-term patient capital will be the next piece of that equation. You put all that together, Caroline, once you've created a project uh, for a sponsor who understands the documentation and the project into which they're investing, then you can actually begin uh, to get traction. So it's a combination of governments leaning in on policy and regulation to create the right uh, environment for private sector development, coupling that with uh, the right kind of de-risking tools from balance sheets like IFCs or EIBs, because we're willing to take longer positions and take more risk. That's what we were designed to do. And then bring on top of us the long-term patient capital, uh, but create the projects. I mean, one of the things that we learned in trying to attract that capital was project by project, an insurance company is not going to come to emerging markets and invest in a solar plant or a wind farm. What they really need is a pool of projects. So how do we create from our own balance sheet, a pool of projects where we can actually bring people together? I don't know if you heard about our um, Amundi Ego Fund, but we had this idea that we could create a green bond fund, help banks issue green bonds, help those banks actually build green books, and then use the vehicle to attract uh, pension money uh, from Europeans. We did it very successfully, $2 billion. And now, you know, a Belgian dentist can invest in green bonds that are coming from emerging markets. So that kind of uh, financial ingenuity and creativity, I think, is the other piece uh, that needs to come into play. And again, that will require additional policy and regulation in all of our countries of operation. Thank you. Um, Vana, um, Stephanie made a, a very good point that the multilateral development banks were, in a sense, designed to take more risk. Um, and yet we know, you know, partly because of their their relationship to the rating agencies that sometimes taking more risk has become difficult for them. Uh, I think you're very committed to taking more risk. Um, is, that, is that an area that has to be looked at? Is there a problem here that MDBs are not taking the degree of risk they should be? They're, they're simply too conservative. And if you, if you sort of look into that, what needs to happen to change that? I mean, you're sitting in Europe where there's been a very large scale commitment, I think, to moving forward on this agenda. But other, other MDBs, regional development banks don't have that luxury. Yeah, that's true. That's a comfortable position that we have here because uh, we have uh, the full support of the member states of the European Union. However, our activities, our projects are being financed out of the money we get from the capital markets because the capital endowment of EIB is, is relatively low in, in view of the balance sheet. So that means we need the trust of the investors who give us 70 to 100 billion euros per year in bond sales. And that is uh, that requires a, a strong position and that requires trust. And basically for the time being, it requires a good position with the rating agencies. That's quite clear. On the other hand, if you have a strong backing like we have from, from the European Union and, and the member states, uh, then I think you, you should go into more risk indeed. That's what we did over the last 10 years. We have considerable, considerably raised the, the level of ambition. Ambition is the name of the game anyway, beyond our direct banking activities. I, I can only encourage the public sector to be very ambitious. And that also sometimes means tell, the pe tell your people, tell your voters that re requires sometimes tough choices. But in the long run, you need them. But long-term business is not the name of the game everywhere. But it, it, it pays off. And for uh, in the present situation, I must say, say what, what I see in the private sector going on in terms of farsightedness, that supersedes considerably what's happening in the public sector. Look at the, the, the letter, that CEO letter that everybody's reading now from, 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 uh, from Larry Fink. Uh, this is an, an opening of the eyes for many people that we should not miss. And uh, under these circumstances, I was not surprised that the at that time lunatic idea of EIB to open a market for green bonds has turned into such a success story. This lunatic idea has now led to a market of more than 1,000 billion euros and uh, it's, it's going to further grow and it will grow into further SDG related activities 
uh, we are now issuing specialized bonds for other uh, SDGs. And there is such an openness on the market for, for going into these activities. On the other hand, there is such a resolve in the private sector to get rid of assets who might one day end up as stranded assets that I think we should learn from the private sector when we do our politics. Yes. So, so the, time, the time is now for, for lunatic ideas or what, yes. what seemed like lunatic ideas. Um, Oliver um, Bate from CEO of Alliance, uh, we've heard a lot about patient capital. Your capital is some of the, the most patient. Um, the, we, we are seeing pension funds and uh, institutional investors step up. What, can, can you concretely, I know it's difficult, we've come up with a list of things that happened, need to happen, but can you prioritize what would make the biggest difference to your industry, to those asset owners, to allow that money to flow in, in, in bigger amounts? So the first thing we need an adoption uh, of regulation, sorry to say, because we are over uh, capitalizing in the sense investments in infrastructure. There's, there is one thing if you invest in uh, publicly traded equities that can be very volatile and lose value for quite a while, but we're applying the same capital logic to infrastructure investments, even though the risk is very different. Uh, that needs to be fixed very quickly. The second thing that we need is we need to really have the transparency on what are the priorities. We've uh, all together mentioned hydro, I don't know how many times today, and we need to have clear commitments from the government what exactly is going to happen. You know, for example, there are great ideas now, unimaginable to create uh, green steel in Europe. That technology actually does exist. We need hydropower, probably from northern Scandinavia. It can be done. It's bankable. It has to be done. I can't do it today because the capital charges we have, by the way, in pension funds, the regulation, the same are too high. And the third one is uh, to make sure that we have um, the regulatory and the pricing support. It's really interesting that we still have the following debate, and please bear with me for five minutes, that we have public accounting office that says, why are we taking private capital that costs whatever five, six percent for equity? Think about that. Our cost of capital is actually eight, but five, six for equity investment when we can borrow the money for free or at negative rate in public markets. Why are we taking private capital? I mean, this is ludicrous, but it's in the newspapers every other week. Yeah, and that's, these are public people. So the, the point that politicians have to say, we need the private money because it is not bringing the money. It is actually bringing the discipline to plan, execute and deliver these projects is not well understood and not well accepted in the public domain everywhere. So that's to Vanna's point. He was very polite. I'm trying to be a bit more specific. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Oliver. I, I do want to to tease out a little bit from all of you. We've talked a lot about public-private. We've talked about MDBs. What we really haven't yet teased out, what is the role within finance for different players working together? Are we seeing that degree of cooperation within industry? And uh, maybe, maybe, Oliver, I can start with, I can reverse the order and start with you because um, you represent one part, um, Al Gore represents another part of finance, we have MDBs represent another. Different horses for courses, as we say, different roles. But is this actually happening or is there a much greater need for collaboration within the industry? I start facetiously, Mark will solve that for us um, because he's actually going to propose that we do this as a cross-sectoral initiative around the common. I think it's really important that we do collaborate across the sectors. And you see it, by the way, Allianz is also one of the larger asset managers in the world. And we find it, uh, I have to be transparent, more difficult. Why? Because a lot of the mandates are legally done by funds and endowments that have very different objectives. By the way, depending where you're coming from, in what country you're residing in, it's also very different uh, understandings of ethics and how long you think. Some, think. some people think very short term, still. So again, we need uh, some regulatory push there to make sure the endowments join. And let me start at the top and then I'm finished. We now need the big sovereign wealth funds to join the asset owner or the net zero alliance wh wherever they fall, but they need to commit. For me, you know, Japan just uh, committed to net zero. Why doesn't this Japanese sovereign wealth fund, one trillion plus, not commit to net zero? Uh, 
You know, we have uh, the Norwegians made the, all their money with oil and gas, and that's fine. And they said, we are going to be sustainable. Why doesn't Norske Band uh, yet commit to net zero? So let's get a list amongst ourselves and let's, you know, get uh, 100 of the top people that are here on call today, everybody, and calling the Norwegian government and said, when is net zero coming? Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. And thank you for reminding us about the sovereign wealth funds. Um, we have to close down this session soon, but I do want to go, uh, before we go into the private session where we can continue, I do want to go to both Mark Carney and Al Gore. Um, Mark, just um, uh, Oliver has, has pointed the finger at you to solve this problem at, at the COP of having, um, having the finance sector take this cross-sectoral approach. Um, yeah. Is it going to happen? Uh, well, if you're not part of solution by Glasgow in November, if you're in the private financial sector, and you're not part of the solution. It's you, you. You're being asked. You have the opportunity. You have the time to make the decision, and you will have made a conscious decision not to be aligned to net zero. It's a net zero cop. That's the objective, and that's the expectation. And we can work together, and we've got the vehicles, and uh, and that's what we'll look to do. And I think there's a lot of goodwill, and so we'll channel. I'll leave it on the positive. We'll channel the goodwill. Okay. But if you're not in, you're out because you chose to be right. in. Right. So you're outing. You're outing people who won't be in, essentially, as a as an incentive, uh, while while keeping it on the positive we're inning side. People yes, you're to inning. Be part of the solution. You're inning. By that's that's exactly. a much better way of saying it. Thank you. Um, Al Gore, I'm going to give um, the last uh, word to you uh, before we close uh, this part of the discussion. Um, you know, you've, you, you've worked a lot now on the financing side uh, with, with great success. Do you, are you, I know you're optimistic in general, but are you, are you optimistic that now climates of opinion can shift? We've seen a big shift in the in the US electoral scene. Is the time right now for aggressive action beyond, beyond uh, executive orders, but legislation to really now make this happen in, 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 in one of our leading, leading what needs to be a leading trailblazer on this issue? Yes, I, I spoke in my first comments about the, the obstacle of policy capture with lobbying and campaign contributions, and we all know that story. But we have seen uh, in state governments in the U.S. and local governments in the U.S. Uh, a massive shift uh, already. Uh, today, uh, President Biden is launching a whole series of new initiatives on climate uh, and the environment. And the public opinion polling shows uh, that the vast majority of Americans support this transition. Indeed, a majority of uh, the Republican Party does as well. Uh, the, the legacy um, uh, pollution intensive industries still have a, uh, a hold on uh, the, the enough in the Congress uh, to slow down progress. But we're moving forward uh, anyway. And people are realizing, you know, the famous... Uh, Hockey player Wayne Gretzky, uh, everybody knows the quote. Uh, he said, I don't skate to where the puck is. I skate to where the puck is going to be. Well, it's worth uh, thinking for a moment about where the puck is going to be at the end of this year in Glasgow. Uh, we, 17 years ago, when we set up a generation investment management, we sought to prove the case that the full integration of sustainability and ESG could actually improve returns. And I, I knock on wood, but the record has been yes. And across the board, ESG investors have been outperforming. Industries that, companies that uh, fully integrate sustainability are outperforming their peers sector by sector. Another uh, new reality by this fall, uh, a new coalition called Climate Trace is going to make public the exact location, uh, the person, the entity responsible, and the amounts of every single significant emission of greenhouse gas uh, pollution everywhere on the planet. So the accountability for these emissions is going to be fully transparent. Uh, and, and that is going to also have a big, in, a big effect uh, on uh, the decisions of investors, whether or not they want to stay uh, in companies uh, that are part of the problem or shift to companies that are part of the solution. Thank you. Thank you, um, Al Gore. Uh, 
and thank you very much to all our panel. I think we heard, um, we heard very eloquently about the need for metrics, regulation, incentive, carbon action on a carbon price, um, cross-sectoral cooperation between the, uh, in the finance industry, a stepped up role for the MDBs, and uh, a plea that you're either with us or you're against us by the end of COP26. And uh, I think it's, it is a more optimistic moment, as, as all of you have said. And I would just encourage those who've been listening in to follow the work of the forum on the net zero transition, which has been diving into some of these very hard to abate industries and, and looking at some concrete solutions. So thank you all.